historian with the National Museum of Industrial History. I want to thank you all for coming here today. This is going to be an amazing talk. I think you guys are all sort of the railroad motor car in the lobby and the beginning of the philosophy too. So we're going to have two talks today. Charles Smith here with the Volunteer Railroads Association and then Bill McCarthy, who is an independent woodworker with Restoration Millwork. And they're going to talk about their uh, projects here. They're going to have time for questions and answers at the end. And I'm going to hand it off to Charlie to talk about Lehigh New England Railroad 549. It's, and it's really a fascinating story. Good afternoon. Everyone hear me okay? Good. Uh, first and foremost, it's a nice day in the Lehigh Valley. There's anything you could have done with your time here at the point. You can come here here to me at the National Museum of Industrial History. Sincerely, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, welcome. To that end, we'll discuss the little motor car you saw out by the ticket window, the Ohio Island 549. As with any presentation, there's five basic questions. Who, what, where, when, why? This presentation is going to focus on the why. Why was the car built? What did it do? More importantly, most importantly, why was it worth preserving from the scrapyard and restoring and bringing it here? To begin with, the National Museum of Industrial History. They have a new charter. Their goal is to encapsulate 200 years of American industrial development and put it within four walls of this building. Even with the building on this side, that's a daunting task. Drawing inspiration from that, though, I am going to focus on the why. Why is this part here? Why would it save? What did it do? The conversation is going to be at a high level. I'm going to move quickly. I'm going to try and put 200 years and less than 20 slides in 20 minutes. Okay. I'm going to ask you to hold the end, your questions till the end of Bill's presentation, so we have time for both. Uh, by all means, ask away what we're going to uh, Some of the things we'll have full time to discuss them in detail, because the first topic we're going to discuss is coal mining. You can conduct an entire college class, and some have, on the history of coal mining in this country. I would suggest, if you're interested in that and the way it was developed, um, Pennsylvania first was coal mine was established in 1775 near Pittsburgh. Uh, coal fueled our forges, our early industry, used to cook food and heat our homes. We built on to power locomotives that transport American industrial aid. It has a vibrant history with a long and detailed story to tell. These two historic sites, these three museums, two historic sites, do a great job of that. If you're interested, please go see them. Uh, they're not far from the museum right now. And the Antelite Heritage Museum and the Lackawanna Coal Mines were actually on the same property in Scranton. So, well worth a visit. Now, once you've got the coal out of the ground, the challenge is coal's heavy. It's bulky. And you had to transport it in mass quantities to burn. The challenge then is the supply chain problem. Yes, even in the 18th century, America had supply chain problems. The first answer to that was trying to move the coal in large volumes by canal boats. Uh, drawn on handmade dug canals, Lehigh Canal, Morris Canal, Erie, of course, Delaware, Delaware and Hudson. They, this was one of the major ways we moved forward in the 19th century. Uh, once you moved it, you needed a company to organize this and help build this. In 1818, that's the Lehigh Canal and Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company did. There's a rich corporate history there with interest of time, I cannot cover this presentation. But that said, you can still experience it not far from the National Museum of Industrial History. The National Climatic Museum is located in Easton. We open, uh, it's seasonal. We open in April, and you should go. Uh, if you want to see what an actual canal boat looks like, ride one. There's one there, you can see there. And it's well worth a visit. Which brings us to the railroad. The LNA, as we know, it was founded in 1895 to improve the process of railroads. All began as smaller, short line efforts trying to develop ultimate plan for Lehigh and the was to Harrisburg to Boston. The MA didn't achieve that, but they got from Slavington out to Maybrook and felt it as a bridge line between the coal region and New England. When you build a railroad, the first thing you have to do is fix it. <laughs> Stuff breaks, wear, drop the elements, it needs to be repaired. Um, to that end, you have to get there. We started out with what you see here. Uh, a Michigan farmer, George Sheffield, found the Sheffield Velocity Farm Company in Three Rivers, Michigan. Uh, Bill's going to tell you more about Velocity's, but for my part, 
It's only important to know if they're powered by the operator and used to inspect and maintain the railroad. Fairbanks Morse, another great name in American history. Uh, in 1888, Charles H. Morse, founder of Fairbanks Morse and Company, bought Warren Wilkes' interests in the company. Mr. Wilkes was Sheffield's original business partner. The Sheffield product line was added to the FM catalog, and FM began general sales agency for all Sheffield products. Fairbanks Morse was a significant position in American industrial history. Beginning with scales, they would ultimately produce farm practice. Uh, factory power plants, diesel engines for submarines, even complete locomotives. Today, they exist as part of America's defense industry. We can trace the 40 bay or the motor car platform, to approximately 1818, when the pipe was first added to the FM catalog. Our car is much younger than that, it's probably late 30s, uh, based on the market we found in the market. So, why would you sell a motor car? A moment ago, I showed you the human powered uh, vehicles you saw. The challenge is there, we had it's not power, the power motor cars are powered by people. Rail is very heavy. It's measured by yard. For example, uh, a six foot section of 100 pound rail will weigh hundreds of pounds. Uh, Edge, ties, spikes, and tools. There's a lot of weight to it. Having a gas powered vehicle to carry their workers and supplies, and if the crew reach their work site faster, a lot less tired. Fight for our little 40B on the railroad. Pictures they say pictures says that one works. If so, we see what we from Doug Lee's book, We High in New England, a call reference back to tell us a lot. Um, I'll be the first plug for the book. Published in 1988 by the Anthracite Railroad Historical Society, is an excellent book for railroad. Uh, they're still available uh, via the local bookseller, train shows, and of course, ubiquitous eBay and Amazon. But they're affordable and it's a great read. Uh, in the photograph you see here, See the bike is looking like R549. Um, it's not our car, it's a sister group, similar. I think it's probably a fair model. But see what they were doing. Start their north day, fix and track. And got some broke, inspected, actually a couple of trailer cars or whatever part it's five feet and off we went. In this photograph, in the lower program, you can also see part of the line. He explained why the point B was built by the Lightweight Modern. Supposed to human power cars. Now, why is it museums that work on the railroad today? That goes what you see here in the bottom right. As soon as railroads really learned they could attach railroad wheels to the bottom, regular automobiles and pickup trucks, you got a larger vehicle that could fall more stuff and greater comfort for your crew. And when needed be, it could take to the public roads so you wouldn't have to bog up the railroad with a motor car going down it and say, keep running trains. Uh, One other thing I want you to notice, the car here was a, um, it's a Pontiac, late 50s Pontiac. It's about five years before it's uh, rare to a bus to this photograph. It's taken up in art at the shop. It's done a very laborious, difficult job where he makes the way. Car looks pretty good, doesn't it? We'll talk about that in a minute. Remember that. End of railroad operations. Um, in addition to coal, we had an England service cement belt. A uh, picture is Bernard purchased painting on the cover of a book. Uh, it's a great book again, and I highly recommend the Anthropic Railroad Historical Society. Um, the railroad saw hard times in its existence during the Great Depression and boom times during World War II. Passenger service ended early, 1938, 1938-39, and then called passenger service. Uh, what was never wealthy railroad, Lehigh and Winland maintained their property and equipment well. Um, the photo you see here is by Gene Flora, taken in Penn Arthur. It's another great book, which I'll share with you briefly. Still in publication today, you can find it, Barbara published. Um, highly recommended if you want to see some shots of Lehigh and Winland in service. Uh, coal traffic did dwindle for decades, and the railroad can see the proverbial end of the line come. However, the Lehigh and Winland avoided. Has drawn bankruptcies that so many Northeast railroads would later suffer. We had New England enter railroad operations on Tuesday, October 23rd, 1961. They did not go bankrupt. That's one of the other reasons why this car is here. We had New England had a very long history of being operated as a good company from the days as a uh, coal and navigation company, coal mining, to the railroad. 
uh, written in their book, Lehi New England, Ed Griggs and John Krause wrote, reportedly the sale of Lehi New England and its assets is connected to more than $6 million from the parent company, partly the picture of a busted and broken down pipe being finally sold for junk. It's another important part of their heritage. The railroad wasn't operated for it. They maintained their stuff. And when they did see it, wasn't going to make a profit anymore. You know, time was coming to, rather than go bankrupt, they took a very sober decision and ended operation. Life after the railroad. 549 uh, survived the scrap reports and drove you all the way to Minnesota. That story is a good one. Uh, a local resident, veteran, Perry Miley, wanted to save a part of the United States. And that desire led him to buy and miss farm. He bought it personally. It's a great story. And even if it's not, I can't tell you all of it. But if you look at next month's Railroad and Rail Band, the full story will be in there. Pictures, photographs, all on how he operated the car for years and our volunteers at the Volunteer Railroad Association eventually acquired it. Next up, this is where I come in. In our group, Volunteer Railroad is a small organization. We're based out of our uh, station in Baltimore, New Jersey. We've moved and restored ourselves. Uh, I will show these two photographs uh, that are not in the magazine. Uh, and the magazine is well worth the price that I would recommend you get. Uh, the first one, the logo I put our, in our first slide, included a bucket grant of the Central New Jersey Railroad. CMJ did purchase part of the Lehigh and did operate the Still operating to this day uh, in around Bethlehem. That railroad was headquartered um, route in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Their major port, which was certainly New Jersey City, what we now know as Liberty State Park, was a gateway for so many immigrants. Uh, the neat thing we see here is we actually got the chance at an invite years ago to bring 549 out to Liberty State Park. We had a ton of fun bringing it there uh, through the connection between United England and CMJ. And if you haven't been to yet, uh, let me say park, I recommend you go. It's a great place to visit. Restoration. This is an almost two decade process that I'm going to boil down to six slides. Uh, you see the day the 40B arrived in New Jersey, top left, our presidents, Casey Smith, and our secretary, company, Chris Bates. Uh, then you see our uh, former member, Craig Hartman, welding the chassis. When I say this is a frame off restoration, we restore the frame too. Every nut and bolt in this car came apart and got put back together. Still have a few more details to put on it. Um, neat little story there. If you look on the bottom left, you see its original motor. One of our members found a rebuilt. Imagine finding a rebuilt Fairbanks horse, Post Piss and Engine in Florida. Got a horse and we installed it in the car. We still have the original. Um, as you can see from one of the other photos, it does smoke a little bit. We need some machinery and we'll hopefully get it. The bottom right is our our treasurer, Carol Smith, and Leonard in the park. We all share a simple vision for the 40B that we wanted back. The only bit of controversy I could say in all the years we've worked on it is that logo we see at the top of It was obviously hand painted. You can still see the brush strokes on it. Probably done it in our shops or somewhere else in the LA. Things like in our really more difficult time to paint. We didn't want it all the time. But there's a tremendous amount of rust there, and in order to preserve the future generations, rather than cut it out or damage it in some way, took the somber decision to be blasted and clean all the rust off it and start fresh. But happy to say that both those still are on the car and they still are hand painted. Big flip will select the Lehigh New England today. This is a great shot um, posted on abandoned mails. It's Form and Arsenal shops. I understand recently they have been sold and may have eventually come down. I hope not, but it's in private hands right now as part of the heavy construction project. Next up, there are still stations out on the line. Um, if you know Portland at all, in Oregon, this is one block off the um, main road as it goes to town. It was Mike's Auto Repair for years. Recently it was sold and is now the home of AJC Auto Works. It's a repair shop, but the station still exists. Modified, but it exists. What's next? As with any fan of Lehigh New England, small railroad, there are a number of us. There aren't a lot of pieces left in the world. 
There's a great organization, American Industrial Preservation Society, that has gone out, formed as a Bible as a great book, and has purchased the former Lehigh New England ST, Alpha number 611. It's a beautiful organization. And hopefully, we'll be again someday soon. It's been brought to Pennsylvania, home. Obviously, not Lehigh New England, but it's still home in Pennsylvania. And we hope to bring our car and the 611 together for the years out. Some function or another. This is a map of Pennsylvania. Vivid, I know. We didn't know this at all, so I came here. This is a map of Pennsylvania's museums and historic sites. One of all the historic sites didn't place in the world. I didn't want to put this information in a back. Inflation is hitting all of us very hard. The dollars will go as far as the still coming as far as the other last year. I began this presentation by thanking you for attending. You gave your time and your money to come here today. These museums and historic sites survived over the lockdowns, lose capacity, and are also being impacted by inflation. They are continuing to survive, but we, by God's grace, we support people like you. This summer, I urge you to consider visiting local museums, national parks, or historic sites. Don't support them out of a sense of obligation. Do support them because they provide a unique product at a competitive price. For example, did you know the large locomotive out part of this building to be operated by you for a small fee? Uh, the organization is already unlike a number of folks in our industry struggling to survive. NMIH is expanding, adding a second floor to this building. They do fabulous different programs throughout the year, including this one, what we're enjoying. And I urge you to come back, visit, take a walk with this fourth back plant. They do a walking tour of the Moravian district, as well as steel plants. Um, there's even a season of kayak at the Lehigh River. We can see the uh, Lehigh Valley from the water. Uh, with that, I want to thank National Museum of Industrial History for inviting us to have our car here. It's been a tremendous day. Uh, good for your tenants today. Uh, I'll take questions after the next presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. That was wonderful. Now, uh, can we find a couple of uh, strong volunteers to help us bring the next presentation into the room? Okay, I got one in the back. Okay. One more. And uh, Bill McCarthy here is going to direct them how to move this piece in. And uh, he'll begin talking once it arrives. I'm wondering, maybe we should just go out there and visit right next to you. And then people might be able to see it better because we're going to be, it's only this high. Okay, so so you guys, okay uh, what they can walk out front and standing up for the talk? Might be a little bit better, better view of the car then. Okay. I think we have everybody here, Bill. Okay. My name is uh, Bill McCarthy, and in my adult working life, I'm now sort of semi retired. I was involved in uh, architectural millwork business, doing uh, sort of fancy woodwork for old buildings being restored. And also, people building expensive new homes that uh, wanted custom items, custom moldings and doors and windows and libraries and bookcases and that sort of thing. And so, when I was doing restoration work for important old buildings, uh, I always had to do my new work had to be done exactly as it was done originally. And so, in the 19th century and early 20th century, they had a lot of specialized uh, woodworking machines for making various joints and things like that. And uh, a lot of these machines are not produced anymore. So uh, because I had to replace like with like and do it exactly as it was done, I would just seek out these antique machines. And when I would find them, they oftentimes uh, you know, needed some sort of repair work. And uh, that got me involved in uh, learning how to become a machinist because I had to fix them myself and it would be too expensive to hire somebody to do it. So uh, I learned a lot about antique machinery and the care, care of it and, and restoring it. So last year I saw where a lot of these tourist railroads, uh, I will take one in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, it's called the Colebrookdale Railroad. 
on the days when they're not running their like steam locomotives or excursion trains, a lot of them have a thing that they call rail bikes. And what that is, it's a, a new device that's made and it has four wheels, like the wheels here, and like two molded seats similar to the chair you're sitting on and bicycle paths. And so you can rent these and go for a ride on the railroad. They, the rental is somewhat expensive. And uh, so that brought to mind about 40 years ago, uh, there was a group, I'm sure this organization still exists. It's called the Bethlehem JCs. And they own the railroad station across the river. That's a, a restaurant. Now, I don't know if they still own it, but they, they owned that building and they rented it out to the restaurant. Now, the JCs would meet on the second floor, which was where the station master used to live. Now, in a closet on the second floor was one of these Sheffield Velocipedes stood up on end, stuffed in the closet. And so when the JC members, which at that point was an all male organization, after their meeting, they might have a couple of drinks and they take the philosophy out and put it on the tracks and take it for a ride. So I remember seeing that years ago. And then at, at last fall, when I saw what they're doing over the Cold Brookdale Railroad, that reminded me of the philosophy. So now I don't know whatever happened to that one that was in the JC building over there, but I called up the Pennsylvania State Railroad Museum in Strasburg, Pennsylvania, and they had one. And I asked if I could come out and photograph it and take measurements. So they said, oh, come on out. So I made an appointment and I went out and uh, photographed it and they were very nice and they helped me take all the measurements and everything. And so then I came home and I threw it up on a sheet of quarter inch plywood, full size. So I could you know, get the idea of how all these parts are interact with each other. And I, I took measurements, so I plugged those measurements into my drawing. And um, now on the original, it was gear driven. Um, so when you work the lever and the pedals, you turn three gears that were two gears that would run the rear wheel. Now, uh, the gears were rather large and somewhat heavy, and I did have gears. But then I thought that I had this sprocket that was, I got that in two. So I thought it would be better and more efficient to use a, a chain drive. And this is like the same size chain that would be on a light motorcycle. And so that eliminates, if it was gear driven, you have to use three gears. Using the sprocket, I just use two. So uh, I used that sprocket. And then uh, I needed some sort of crank ring. So I was looking on the internet and I found you could buy these cranks here, and uh, therefore making your own unicycle. You know, unicycles what like a one-wheel vehicle with a seat on it. So they were rather inexpensive. They're like nine dollars each. So I bought three of these cranks, and then I did the machining work. I made the shafts, and, and so I decided that it, uh, on the original, your foot treadles and your hand lever were all connected to a common crank throw. So what that meant was, if your uh, crank was in a certain position, which is called either top dead center or bottom dead center, you pull on it, nothing would happen. So you'd have to take your foot, give yourself a push to get going, then it would work. So I didn't like that idea, so I decided to make all three independent on the same shaft. So you wouldn't have any top dead center or bottom dead center. So you could just hop on and ride. Now, this has an outrigger. It will have an outrigger that comes over here. It has a 12 inch wheel on it that uh, will stabilize it. And the wheels are out of stock. And I just got notice from the company yesterday that they sent it by UPS. So I should get it next week. Sometime. Um, but these were made to be taken uh, uh, disassembled rather easily. There'll be two big wing nuts here so that you can take the outrigger off. And then uh, this is made just like the original with these handles on here. And so two people can pick it up and turn it around if necessary. Um, 
I decided to go with slightly more comfortable seats. <laughs> In my woodworking business, I used to make winter chairs, and this is basically a winter chair seat. Uh, and then the brake is this lever under the seat here. When you pull up on this, it puts a big shoe against the, the wheel. Now, the original wheels were almost identical to those wheels, a little bigger diameter, and they were made out of steel with the wooden center. And this company uh, makes these wheels for these rail bikes that are you know, used on the uh, tourist railroads. But this is made exactly like the original, you know, the frame and then these turnings and then there's like these little smooth turnings and all that. So I copied the original exactly. Uh, the only difference I, I made some improvements in the driving seat. And I also added an extra seat here. Um, the rest, on the original, uh, they just had this little platform on the back. And uh, so I decided to add an extra seat so you can put the passenger on here. That snaps in. And uh, I also will have foot pegs that come down so the passenger has something to put his feet on. But the operator will, I had a hip replacement, so the operator will sit here. And then you can operate just feet. But I decided to do it ultimately. So uh, essentially, it works like a three cylinder engine. You have three power strokes per, per uh, revolution. And this will be much quieter than the original because the wheels are made out of a very hard molded polyurethane. So it will be quiet. And you know, steel wheels, steel on steel, is a little bit going to. So as soon as I get my wheel, then I'll make now the outrigger has a curve to it and a truss rod underneath. And the original was steam bent, and I'm probably going to laminate about thin quarter inch thick pieces of wood. It, and it's, it's as strong and it's a little easier to do. Um, but the original had this wooden connecting rod. Now I put ball bearings in, which is also but uh, so I'm anxious to be able to give it a try. Uh, so as soon as I get my wheel and, and make that out of my work, I'd like to try it out. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. What does it weigh though? Uh, with, right now it's maybe 110 pounds. Uh, I can pick up one end and wheel it around like a wheelbarrow. Now, if you remember with Charles's talk, he started it out and because this was originally made by the Sheffield Car Company. And there's a gentleman named George uh, Sheffield invented this. He was a farmer in Michigan and he, he lived out in an extremely rural area. And I guess the closest thing to his farm was some railroad tracks. And he got, he was, I guess he also did cat making or whatever, right? So he got the idea for this. So he built one. And he didn't ask the railroad, and he tried it out, and it worked really well. And so he knew that the railroad wouldn't be terribly excited with him using it on their railroad. So he would run it at night and go into town. And then one night when he's coming back, he found the tracks were broken. So he went back and notified the railroad. They were really happy. And then they saw it, and they said, we want a couple of those. So he started his company, the Sheffield Car Company. And then uh, that was in business for what, 10, 15 years. And then he, he sold it to the Fairbanks Morris Company, which was headquartered up in uh, Vermont, St. John's in Vermont. Um, but uh, like I said, the, the State Railroad Museum has one that all original paint and stenciling on it is beautiful. And then uh, stuff with JC's, I don't know what happened to that, but it's in a closet on the second floor. That restaurant. Does anybody have any questions? Well, it gives you, uh, yeah, you, like I said, right now it's almost like a three cylinder engine because 
defeat our independence and, and dismiss. Uh, uh, but yet, now, if you, I read where Sheffield's patent, he came out with some official patents, and one of them was a sliding seat that was also connected up to the crank. Would you think it like a, one of these racing shells? Does both seats slide back and forth? Skull, racing skull there. The original one is just a picture of the rear of the seat in Strasbourg, about 10 miles east of Langley. This out was the. Well, I, I have Toby foot pegs that pull down. Uh, it, uh, Now they also had one that had a platform, which that was their telegraph book. So the guys were out fixing the telegraph lines. I guess they take more equipment with them. Anyone else have any questions? So is the one at the River Museum the original one? That's a Sheffield, yes. Like the prototype one. Or... No, that's original, original, and it's uh, very good condition, has all the original paint. It has stencil on it, shut through a car company. It's, it's always kept inside. It's a very good condition. Uh, if you want to see a Sheffield Motor Slate, hop in the car. And if any of you haven't sat in the car, what are you waiting for? <laughs> I'm going to throw some up faces, but I'm president of the Volunteer Railroads Association. I just want to make a point on this car. Charles, Charles talked about you know, the history and stuff on it, but the drivetrain on this car. It's unlike anything else that we own. We have a number of cars, and, and it was quite ingenious on how they did it. Uh, it was a five position notches, like a locomotive has eight, eight notches. Uh, this one has five, and it can go forward or reverse from you move the wheel one way, and the flywheel touches the, uh, the drive wheel. Makes the car go one way, it can go the other way, and it makes it go the other way. Uh, the interesting thing about it, the big handle sticking up, you had to release that before you moved your your position. And the reason was when you're when you're done, they can take a look underneath with the big flywheel. If you tried to move that and you took it out of the notch without the releasing of the clutch handle, we have, the thing would go all the way to the outside. Where you were going. I can tell you, I've driven this car. I don't know how fast it goes. I'm not sure I wanted to find out <laughs> because I was in about the third notch, from just cracked and going much faster than the Bell Bell, which is where we were running it in the photo that you said. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really interested to find out what it is. We, we, we work with the railroad in South Jersey, and one of these days we're going to get this thing out and go, and go find out what we do. The other thing that's really cool about this engine, those of you who know Fairbanks Morris, they used to have a little piston. Part of the reason why they're in submarines uh, is because they're profile, and that has a post piston. So when it runs, it's alive. It's not, it's not just a machine, it's alive. You watch everything work. The valves, the piston, the rods, everything on that car as it goes is an amazing sight to see. Is that two stroke or four stroke? It's a four stroke. Uh, and so it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a thing to watch. And when we got the car, Terry Terry Miley, we got a pro and put mufflers on it. It never happened. It was just like an ass. The sound. You know, back years ago, you hear the commercials about the, uh, the earplugs and soon the government would do this. These guys had them yet. Uh, there's just two pipes that come out of the cylinders. That was it. Uh, so it's quite an interesting piece of machinery and, and the evolution between the two. Uh, this was definitely easier to work. The gentleman asked about, does this help? I've, I've written these, and we own a hand pump car, which we're currently doing a restoration on as well. Uh, I can tell you with 100% certainty, being able to pull on that handle, push on those feet, 
next time. Thanks for working. There are about 220 out of each. They did. But the speed of having a jack on the turn it around. No. No. This is hard to turn around. Because you go forward or backwards exactly the same. The speed was the same. Nothing changed. Set the train to the position. Uh, Bill made these really nice seats. That's the seat. And that's what this seat would have been. It was just a hunk of wood, basically, that the guy sat in. Uh, have you tried to find any parts with it? Yes. Yes. There's plenty of power for this. This car would have pulled trailer cars with ties and plates and whatever on it. That's, that's what this car, this car was not just, really wasn't an inspection car. It was a work car. They could use it for inspection. We have one of the pictures Charles showed of the car down at uh, Liberty State Park. The car that was behind it was a small UP car. Uh, that car was an inspection car. Two people could sit in, go out and check the tracks. Then this car would have gone out towing the materials necessary for this. Too much. I don't know. Uh, it's a heavy car. It's it's uh it's it's not like those. Yeah, with the car body and everything, it's uh, not like that. So one thing I'll just jump in the end to the next car. As with every ball in the so we can ask. Uh, looking at the car right now, it isn't done. Uh it's missing your glass, missing your headlight, we have more paint work on her too. Uh, he asked, why don't we bring this big car to National Museum Industrial History? Because this fall, unfortunately, is somewhere in the past. Uh, to get this car around, we have a trailer that we bought and worked on just for it. All those things, but the inspiration for that trailer was this car to be able to bring out places like this and you folks can see it. We arrived at our base on the KMC Zero Lines. Find the only thing we had left in the trailer was a cut chain. Thankfully, that ones did not bother to look inside the seat tipping container or the other buildings where the car was kept. So it's original motor. This is actually the rebuilt motor inside of it. Original motor and the car and all its parts. Still safe. Cost about $40,000. Uh, there's a GoFundMe out there right now. Thanks for watching the car. If you can help us, please do. But we are going to continue working on it. Get weather stripping. We're going to get our new glass. Get our headlight back. And she'll be just like the baby. We'll have the yard. Five minutes.